Thank you very much. I have to say, I was just talking to Dr. Vallejo and Dr. Sullivan, and I, I think it's very clever that they're actually taking the topics for next year from some of your questions. And I thought the questions in the last session were really great, so keep them coming. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about FDA warnings, and perhaps I could just stop here and thank Dr. Carvalho, because he may have pretty much summed it up by saying we pretty much ignore them. Um, but I do have a few more things to say. So, so first of all, for those of you who aren't from the United States, what is the FDA? Um, what kind of warnings do they make? Um, how do they impact physicians, obstetric anesthesiologists, and anesthetists in particular? Um, and what does this mean to us? So first of all, the FDA is the branch of the United States Department of the uh, branch of the United States Department of Health and Human Services. So there's a Secretary of Health and Human Services, and under them there's an FDA commissioner. And they have a mission, and the mission is to protect the public health, ensuring safety, efficacy, security of human and veterinary, didn't know that, also your dog is protected, biological projects, products and medical devices. So basically all our drugs and devices. Um, I actually didn't realize that they also have the mission to ensure the safety of our food supply, our cosmetics, and our products that emit radiation. So how do they enforce this mission? What can they do? So they have a couple things. First of all, they can um, make warning letters. And warning letters simply inform a company that they're not following FDA regulations. And warning, most companies take warning levels, warning letters fairly seriously because they can create bad press for them. Um, above a warning, they can actually cause, do a seizure, meaning they can actually remove a product from market. They can require every pharmacy to send the drug back. So that's a pretty severe thing. On top of that, they can um, create an injunction. That means they can have a court order telling the company they have to stop violating the rules. Um, an example of that I'll give you is false marketing. And beyond that, if a company's really recalcitrant, they can have criminal prosecution. And they're pretty severe, actually. The first violation is a misdemeanor um, and can lead to imprisonment of up to one year of anybody in the company thought to be involved. So that's pretty severe. And second violation, or actually um, evidence that they've intended to defraud the consumer, um, can result in a half a million dollar per infraction in imprisonment up to three years. So these are pretty, pretty serious um, tools they have at their disposal. So let me give you an example of a FDA, recent FDA warning. In 2011, liposomal bupivacaine was approved by the FDA for very specific indications. It was approved for hemorrhoidectomy and bunionectomy. And the, the reason that it was approved for those specific indications were that those were the specific human trials that were used for the approval. And the maximum approved dosage was 266 milligrams for 24 hours, and this was based on the phase three studies in these populations. Um, and then the company began to investigate the drug for um, populations in which it was not FDA approved. Now this is totally legal, and in fact Stanford, Dr. Carvalho did some of those studies using liposomal bupivacaine and Taplox, and that's totally, you know, this is how we learn other ways that drugs can be used. Problem is, um, that in, starting in 2016, the company started advertising use for those uses. Um, and the FDA issued a warning letter um, telling it that it was, it was advertising for unapproved use, and that's not okay. The interesting, and so I'm, I'm giving you a little like FDA gossip here, if there is such a thing, the kind of interesting that, the thing that happened is that the company sued the FDA. Now, I've never heard of that happening before, and that was kind of shocking. And they sued them on behalf of free speech. They said that that warning letter impacted on their free speech. Um, and I kind of would have thought that the FDA would have come down hard on that, but they came up with an amicable agreement saying that a drug company can engage in truthful, non-misleading speech about off-label uses of a new drug. So that's actually kind of a new thing. So 
in terms of the FDA, how can they control us, what they can do to us? So they can also issue us a warning. It's not called a, a warning. It's called a letter that they send to doctors. Um, and they can warn us about purchasing um, and using drugs in unapproved manner. An example, recent example of this was that people were buying fake Botox. You can imagine for what reasons we see alternative Botox outside. Um, but there were actually doctors who were buying Botox from foreign and unlicensed suppliers, meaning people kind of cooking it up in their kitchen. You can imagine what a concentration error would do there. And actually, there, this came to light because patients were taken to the emergency room who were paralyzed after uses of this unapproved Botox. Um, so they can send you a letter telling you to stop this. They can also shame you. There is a list of doctors that is online from the FDA if you've gotten a letter. Um, so if your patient's Googling you and they find out that you've had FDA warnings for your fake cosmetic Botox use, then that's probably not a good thing for your practice, whatever it is. And then they can also have criminal cases. Um, so this is an example, was 2016, um, an Iowa oncologist um, was sued because they recklessly billed for unapproved cancer drugs um, that were counterfeited. So I think one thing that people are most concerned about are the black box warnings. And as Dr. Carvalho said, there are, part of the problem is there are so many black box warnings now. And I'll go through and tell you about some of them, but they're on many of the drugs that we use in our practice. So a black box warning is the most severe warning that's offered by the FDA. And they offer this when they consider that a drug carries significant risk of serious or life-threatening adverse events. So you'd think that we would take black box warnings very seriously, and I think part of the problem is that there are so many of them that we really can't practice without using drugs that have a black box warning. And so more than in, in this study, um, more than 8% of our drugs in total carry a black box warning. So of all drugs, like almost one-tenth of them have a black box warning and physician adherence is voluntary. So basically, what you do with a black box warning um, is between you and the patient. Um, but in one study, 0.7% of prescriptions per specifically violated a black box warning, and less than 1% of those resulted in any harm at all. So I would say that maybe they're issuing too many black box warnings. Um, so, what about our black box warning on general anesthetics? Some of you guys may be familiar, recently the FDA put out a black box warning on general anesthetics about use in children and fetuses. So what drugs are those? And those are every drug that's known to potentiate GABA receptors and block NMDA receptors. So in practice, that's almost every general anesthetic drug that we use. That includes desflurane, sevoflurane, halothane, isoflurane, Propofol, ketamine, etomidate, lorazepam, midazolam, methohexatol, and pentobarbital. So I would challenge you to give a general anesthetic without a drug that has a black box warning. So what evidence was for this warning? Why did they do this? Well, a lot of us in, in the anesthetic pharmacology world were pretty much mystified, not so much by the warning, but by the timing of the warning because there had been published studies in animals for many, many years. One of the first ones was from Vesna Todorovic, and we're about the same age. So this would have been like 1990 that she started doing these studies, where she showed that general anesthetic drugs that um, potentiate GABA or block NMDA receptors cause really profound behavioral disturbances in young or ne in fetal or neonatal animals. Um, and these studies actually have been replicated in primates, so it's not just a rat or mouse issue. Um, and it can, so uh, it can actually, uh, in primates it occurs when the drugs have been given for more than three hours. Um, and some studies, so then there have been, what about humans, right? A lot of animal studies don't translate. So the Smart Tots initiative from the IRS was designed in order to really fund good trials to look at this. And the results have been really profoundly mixed. So that was what was really perplexing about this. As the human data really came in, and the real experts in this area really were unable to come to a conclusion, um, the FDA then put out their warning, not when there was really good evidence from animals, but no evidence from humans. So it was a little mysterious. 
Um, so what anesthetics are unaffected? How could you possibly give a general anesthetic with unaffected drugs? Well, it would be challenging, and I actually looked for case reports to see if there were any of giving general anesthetics with these drugs. So I'd be really interested if any of you have um, in our discussion section, but basically opioids aren't affected. So you can use remifentanil, and remifentanil in and of itself can't be used for general anesthesia, but you don't need a heck of a lot of something else in order to um, have a synergistic interaction. Alpha-2 blockers aren't affected, so dexmedetomidine and clonidine, um, and local and regional anesthetics. So basically, um, in human beings, we rely a lot on local and regional anesthetics um, that I'll talk about more. But I'm really curious whether you could use a lot of remifentanil and a little bit of dexmedetomidine and give a general anesthetic. I've never tried it, and honestly, I couldn't find any case reports, but I'd be interested if any of you guys know. So with that sort of theoretical and FDA gossip perspective, what are we supposed to tell patients about this? What are we supposed to tell pregnant patients? Well, what I tell them is that there's never been a human study that has documented ill effects in a child in, in pregnant patients. And particularly for cesarean section and most of, the, most of the surgeries we do in pregnant patients, that it's probably not long enough because the studies in primates where they did shorter than three hours showed no effect. So probably we're good for the surgeries that we do. A little questionable in terms of fetal um, anesthesia for fetal surgery. Um, and so there's actually an international registry that's been developed to follow those patients. So we don't really have an answer. Um, so how can we miti mitigate these effects if we're worried about them? One, try to do things in a shorter period of time, perhaps stage operations where it possible. Obviously, we're not doing surgery on pregnant women where it's not necessary. Um, and when you need to do a general anesthetic, combine with a regional anesthetic as much as possible so that you can use the minimum amount of the general anesthetic. And where you require high concentrations, consider adding dexmedetomidine or remifentanil to limit the amount of the other drugs that you need to use. In terms of fetal surgery, a lot of times we use very, you know, just traditionally we've used very high doses of volatile anesthetics for their uterine relaxant um, effects, and probably we don't have to use that. Probably we should use other uterine relaxants instead of using these very high dose volatile anesthetics. So what about opioids? So we've been talking about the opioid epidemic. Pretty much every opioid has a black box warning now. Should that deter us? Well, I don't believe it should deter us above and beyond what we've already discussed about concerns for neonatal abstinence syndrome um, and effects on breastfeeding. Um, but just do know that there's a black box warning on every opioid for addiction, abuse, misuse, life-threatening respiratory depression, accidental ingestion, and neonatal withdrawal. Benzodiazepines have added the black box warning also for benzodiazepines, for the interaction between opioids and benzodiazepines. And if you thought you were safe, even with non-steroidals, a lot of non-steroidal drugs carry a black box warning um, for their cardiovascular effects. Not only the COX-2 selective, but also the COX-1 selective have been shown to have cardiovascular effects. Now, I would very happily maintain that this is not relevant to the huge majority of our population. But again, in pregnancy, you have increased risk of clotting. So. One of my favorite black box warnings, if you can have a favorite black box warning, I guess that marks me as kind of an odd person. But one of my favorite ones is clonidine, because the black box warning, there's a very nice article um, that I put up here, just the title of, on clonidine for labor pain. It kind of considers the two sides of the coin. It's something that I use very commonly, um, particularly when I was at Columbia. Um, but the fact is it does have a black box warning, and the black box warning is specifically for obstetrical peri and postpartum use. And the reason for this black box warning was that epidural clonidine and, and intrathecal clonidine is very commonly used in the chronic pain world. Um, and relatively higher doses are used, because of course these are chronic pain patients that are on very high doses of opioid. And clonidine is really a go-to drug systemically in the chronic pain world. So people who had familiarity with that use then started using it in obstetrical anesthesia. 
and use very high doses, like 50 to 100 micrograms of clonidine intrathecally, which is about 10 times what I would use. Um, and there was hypotension, not surprisingly, um, and fetal effects from hypotension, meaning emergency C-sections. So that's where this black box warning comes from. And interestingly, it seems like black box warnings don't have a shelf life because once it comes out, it's kind of there for all eternity. On the other hand, since that black box warning was posted, there have been probably more than 100 studies using clonidine in pregnant patients that have shown very good efficacy. In fact, probably, I was talking before with some people after the session talking about in cases where you can't or don't want to use an opioid, you know, I will commonly use either clonidine or epinephrine. Um, and uh, in my uh, analgesic to potentiate the local anesthetic. And what I always teach the residents is that it's very convenient that it's the same dose of fentanyl as epinephrine or clonidine. It's one to two mics per ml. Um, and I tell them that God made it that way so old people like me can remember. And I usually get a good laugh out of them from that. So my simple practical advice is look at the FDA literature, but find out actually what, what were the issues that supported these FDA warnings. And you can find that on the FDA website. And, then, and the FDA warning always says, always says within it that you need to assess whether the benefits of using the drug for your particular patient are greater than the risks. And that what, that's what it comes down to us as the, for, as the physician for taking care of the individual patient. Thanks very much.